Yeah. Well, I don't really know how to segue from hockey to Mark, so <laughs> we're just going to go straight into it. Yeah, yeah, we'll pray. I need lots of it today because I'm a little scatterbrained at the moment, uh, but we'll hope that God can n- narrow us out, fix us, fix us up. <laughs> Well, I don't know that it's been not so good. It's just been busy and, yeah, I'm scatterbrained. Yeah, so we'll see if Jesus can help us figure this out. So let's pray and see what happens from there. Father, help. Uh, we need, we need to, your spirit to help us focus and and to help us to see what you want us to see tonight. Would you be a part of our discussion as well? Uh, would it be full of salt and light and would we be an encouragement to one another as we seek to understand what it is that you want us to see? And so we give you this night and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> That's true. Jesus is like salt. That's Just true. A little sprinkle makes life a little bit more palatable. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What happens if you have a lot of salt, though? Uh, you get a heart attack? Yeah. Is that? Sometimes you need a lot of salt. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of Jesus. Yeah. That's coffee. Yeah, yeah. I'm going with coffee. All right. Okay, Mark. Quick Mark's recap. Oh. Mark is telling us about Jesus, who he claims is the Son of God, who is the embodiment of good news, who is the King, the Messiah of Israel and of all the world. And so he chronicles Jesus' ministry, his teaching, his healings. He's even able to affect the elements in a variety of different ways. And that leads to tension and confrontation with religious leaders. And especially last week, we saw uh, really the climax of, the, um, of Jesus' confrontation and teaching against the religious establishment and religious leadership. By the way, if you haven't turned in homework, I, I, I can take it from you. Uh, but thank you for those of you who did write reflections. I know that was a tough one, by the way. Um, In fact, I I assume for some of us that that's not something we think about a whole lot because we've had good experiences with religious leaders and religious establishment, and I think that's wonderful. I'm so glad for that. Some of us have not had as many good experiences. (laughs) You can name all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, but I do hope that it was something you considered, not as a means of becoming cynical, but as a means of being wide-eyed and seeing the reality of the world in which we live and the ways in which even the best things, God-ordained things like the church, have human beings that are broken and fallen, and they can mess things up, and yet God still is in the business of redemption and salvation resurrection and new life and that continues to be the case through the church anyway so that was a large portion of what we covered last week um, is jesus and the tension with the religious establishment Um, and that will um, really come to a head over the next few chapters even though jesus won't be teaching or pushing against it much they will be enacting um, horrible things upon him. Uh, We'll get to that in a moment. First, the world behind the text that I want to look at tonight. Um, So we're going to try to get through chapters 13 and 14 of Mark. Chapter 13, that whole chapter, is uh, fascinating. And, And there are multiple ways people have looked at it, but it can fall into one of two camps. So I, I want to uh, give some behind the text uh, to where those camps are coming from. Um, so first we have to talk about a branch of theology that's called eschatology. Eschatology. 
Eschatology is theology about last things. Eschatology coming from the Greek word eschaton, which means last or last things. So when we're talking about eschatology, what we're talking about is the end of all things. Uh, so um, we typically associate that with Jesus' second coming, his return, uh, God's judgment upon the world, um, but also the recreation of the world, of a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem, as Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 depict. It's all those things, it's the things leading up to it, all things that are associated with the culmination of life as we know it on the earth as we know it at this point in time. Um, and so there's, there's, man, all sorts of different ideas about what that is going to look like um, from all sorts of different Christian perspectives. And it's actually rooted in the Jewish idea of the end of time. So even in um, the Hebrew scriptures, the Jewish biblical writers start to get a glimpse, particularly through the prophets, of what is to come in the end. And they use this phrase, the day of the Lord, that's worth writing down, multiple times throughout the Old Testament. And it generally refers to, well, it specifically refers to God's day of judgment, but it generally refers to these last things, the eschaton, um, anything that is to come toward the end of time when God judges, but God also resurrects those who are dead and makes everything right so that things are as they are supposed to be. And so in Christianity, through Jesus, this idea carries on but takes on an, an additional nuance. It is Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the one who, upon his return, inaugurates the day of the Lord. Does that make sense? Okay. And we find this um, potentially here in Mark 13. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but also 1 Thessalonians and then Revelation and a couple of other places within uh, the New Testament. Okay, so that, that that's one camp in in uh, that's trying to figure out what's happening in Mark thirteen. The other camp is really focused on um, Roman and Jewish history, particularly as it relates to what happens at the temple um, and in Jerusalem around the time of the Jewish Roman War. So in A.D. 66, a war breaks out uh, between the Romans and the Jewish zealots. Um, and the, the zealots are um, <laughs> quite disorganized, actually. Uh, they have all sorts of different camps of people who are trying to fight off against the Romans, and they have a hard time uh, coming together and uniting in their fight against Rome, and Rome takes advantage of that. But throughout this period, there are many different Jewish leaders who claim to be, or others claimed on their behalf, that they were messiahs. So I'm just going to name a few for you. There was one named Menahem, Eleazar was another, John of Geshala, Animus, another man named Jesus, but this is a Jesus who is son of Gamalus, and Simon, son of Geroas. And that's just a few. There were more uh, besides these. But these are prominent military leaders within the zealot movement who are trying to fight against the Romans during the Jewish-Roman War uh, from AD 66 to it's ending in A.D. 70. And in A.D. 70, Rome attacked Jerusalem over the course of five months, sieged the city, raised the whole city, except for uh, very small parts of it that they appreciated. And in particular, they destroyed the temple. And that is a huge turning point in Jewish history, Christian history as well, but especially Jewish history. Because up until this point, as we've talked about before, the temple is the center of Jewish life. Everything revolves around the temple 
and the religious establishment um, from within it. Um, so the priests are a major part of the Jewish religion. Once the temple is destroyed, Judaism itself, the entire religion, makes a huge shift to what we now call rabbinic Judaism. In other words, Judaism that is centered around the teaching of rabbis. Um, and from there, um, over 2,000 years, we get the Judaism that we have today. That's not centered around the temple and the sacrificial system, but it's centered around gatherings in synagogues, um, much like what Christians do. Um, of course, not worshiping Jesus or reading from what we call the New Testament, but centering their worship on the Hebrew scriptures. So, so it, AD 70 is a big, big date. So if you're, if you're curious about history, particularly Judeo-Christian history, AD 70 is a major, major marker in Judeo-Christian history, especially Jewish history, but Christian history as well, as it is the moment that the temple is destroyed. So out of these two sets of ideas come two camps trying to figure out what's happening in Mark 13. And essentially, it boils down to this question. Is Mark 13 a way that Mark is revealing the eschaton, in other words, last things? Or is Mark 13 a prediction of the temple's fall that will come in AD 70? Or is it some sort of combination of both of those things? That question, or those, that set of questions, is what I want you to have in the back of your mind as we go through Mark 13 tonight. And so I'm going to read 13, and then we're going to talk together about, based on our reading, do you think that Mark is talking about last things? Do you think he's talking about the temple? Or is it some sort of combination of the two? And if so, which parts belong to which camp? Okay? Are you ready? Mark 13. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll get into some of the details of it. So uh, recall that right before this, Jesus is in the temple. He sits down, and he's watching people put money into the treasury, and he sees the widow put in her very small amount, and he commends her for her generosity. And then... We get to Mark 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones! What magnificent buildings! Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he, and, he will, dece er, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, 
let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. Shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Okay, so we have Jesus who has had these confrontations with the religious establishment at the temple. He's just finished up doing some teaching in the temple and warning against their leaders. And as they're leaving, some of the disciples proclaim, wow, look at the big stones that they used to build this temple. These are some big buildings, aren't they? Magnificent. And Jesus is, yeah, they're all going to come down. (laughs) Do you see? Not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And so then they get to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples ask him, okay, tell us when these things will happen. And that question leads into this long monologue that we just read. So I want to start just uh, by asking you, based on the reading that we just had, of those camps that I described to you earlier, those who lean toward, oh, this is mostly about the eschaton, the end things, the last times, or last things, um, or is this mostly about the temple and its impending doom, or is it some combination of the two? So based on what we just read, I'm curious um, what you think. Um, So let's start with the first. What are some, um, I guess, images or words or phrases that would make you think or lead you to believe that this is about the last things? Like the whole world. Wow, okay. Okay. Good. Somebody else. That made me think of when the temple comes down. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, so Marilyn's thinking more specifically about the temple and, and that, that phrase. Yeah. You see why there's two camps on this. Right? We're already seeing one person sees uh, one image one way and another person seeing it a, a different way. Okay. I want to hear more, though. What other things lead you to think? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, in uh, verses five through eight, uh, Jesus begins by saying, "Watch out!" By the way, we see that phrase multiple times here in this passage, don't we? Okay. When you see Jesus say, "Watch out," he's saying. Pay attention, be alert, uh, recognize what's going on, okay? So then he says... I have a tendency to think it's the end times because like in 24 and then in 26, everyone will see the man, son of man coming in the clouds. Okay. Uh, the earth turns dark, uh, the moon's, the light's gone uh-huh. until... The Lord comes back, yeah, it's total destruction. Okay. This is the second time you've done it. You, you, you've triggered that thing into my brain with the news that was on today and tonight about the earthquakes in uh-huh. Iceland uh-huh. and everything that's going on in Gaza where there's, you know, it, it's wars and wars. And yeah. and uh, the baby's taken out of the incubators and the nursing mothers and everybody running and you can't see in the sky because of, of mm-hmm. yeah. all the plumes from the uh, the explosions and all the huge buildings are now a pile of rubble. Yeah. Kind of. Everything seems very apocalyptic, right? Mm-hmm. Very. They use and, that word. And time. Very word. Yes. I'm not surprised they use that word. <laughs> That's the second time you've done it. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 the fact that this, all of Mark, and no, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, Mark is in your book. I'm supporting you. Because I think this whole, all of Mark, is kind of, when you're looking at what's going on over there now, you can see so many similarities, parallels. So, back to your original question, I think it's both. Okay. Okay, if we're going to go with both, okay, I'm I'm, I'm working with you. The temple is destroyed, there's nothing left of it, but in the meantime, Jesus is saying this stuff, and he's going, this is what's going to happen, but be on the lookout, because that's not, that's not the big, big picture. This is just part of the whole picture. Does that make sense? Uh So that destruction is just part of his story. And if you read more into it, it is he's telling of, hey, just not right now, but your whole life, pay attention. Be on guard. Keep your guard up. Be on watch. How come? How come what? What is the point of being on guard? Oh, good question. (laughs) <laughs> it's not on guard as much as it is to stay true to your faith. It's not an on guard. It's. Well, he said, beware, 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 yeah. beware. I, I, I but I think it's not. Once you recognize that this is the end. This is hey. See this coming under the Well, but what difference does it make? I mean, if I recognize it's the end, it's the end. If I don't recognize it's the end, it's the end. It's not even aware. It's like, don't let your Christian guard down. In other words, don't, don't, don't have your false prophets. Yeah, don't have false prophets. Don't throw your Christianity out the window and go, well, the world's coming to an end. Watch well, what I can do in the meantime. But, but his description of false prophets who are doing miracles and doing all of the things that real prophets do, how do I go? Oh, that guy's twelve. <laughs> yeah. See, that's your question, James. That's a good question. Is there, that's a really good question. Is there a, 
questionnaire we could ask you. <laughs> 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 I always take the beware. Of that. Okay, were you born of a virgin named Mary? <laughs> So I, I want to focus just on that section really quickly because the earthquakes were brought up and the wars are, are, uh, have been brought up and, and this idea of birth pains. This is all within the same context, verses 5 through 8. Um, so Jesus begins by saying, the watch out. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Did you catch that? Do not be alarmed by wars and rumors of wars. So he's, he said, keep an eye out, be aware, watch out. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed by that. And then he goes on. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. That's later. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines, these are the beginning of birth pains. Yeah, so if you think about birth pains as this uh, metaphor for the event of giving birth and having a child, right? All of these things that he's describing that seem kind of cataclysmic, things that we often associate with the end times, the apocalyptic things, Jesus is actually saying, actually, that's the beginning. That's not like nothing, nothing eventful has even really happened yet. Like the birth hasn't happened. That's just stuff that happens beforehand. In other words, people have often read those verses as these are the signs of the times. Actually, in Mark's perspective, these are non-signs. Does that make sense? These do not point to, or at least not yet. These are just things that have been happening throughout all of human history, right? They have happened. They continue to happen. And even the contemporary history from Mark, um, Mark's time period and leading up to AD 70, has all of these things. They're very prominent. Give you some examples here, okay? So, uh, we have the war, the Jewish-Roman war, that happens in AD 66 to AD 70, very destructive, okay? Uh, earthquakes got brought up. Um, in AD 61, there was an earthquake in Philippi. AD 62, earthquake in Pompeii. And, and then in Jerusalem itself, uh, earthquake in AD 67. Um, from the period of about AD 41 through AD 68, there are famines happening all over the region as well. So within the contemporary context of the passage, all of the things that Jesus referenced here, those things are already happening um, and, of course, continue to go on. So for people who are going to interpret Mark 13 as saying, no, this is really about the temple, they will then point to all these historical things that Jesus is referring to here as evidence for where they're coming from. So, once again, we're kind of with, is it end times? Eh, maybe. Uh, but we actually have solid evidence that all of these things could be pointing toward just the, just the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Okay? So, I heard a couple of you say, I think both is happening. Um, if it's both, how do we sort out which verses are about the temple and which verses are about the end times? Or is there a way that all of it can be about both? And if so, how do we read it that way? Like Russ said, starting with chapter verse 24, then into 26, then everyone will see the sign of that kind of leads me to believe he's now talking about the end of time. 
Uh -huh. Versus just the temple. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could be. And then it talks about the four winds, and that's in the end times too. And then the As in the book of Revelation refers to mm -hmm. people being gathered together from the four winds. By the way, when you see four winds, that's actually a fairly common, um, not just biblical, but um, ancient text reference to every direction, so all around the world. Uh, so if you're you're going to the four winds, in other words, you're like a world traveler. Yeah. So so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the those images of the sun being darkened and the moon not giving its light. You notice that's a quote. From Isaiah? Anyone know what the context of Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10 is? Or Isaiah 34, verse 4? Because you have both of those passages are referring to these images. I see some people flipping there. I'll, I'll let whoever flips there first give us a little context of what is happening in Isaiah 13. While they're looking for that, I want to go back to Mike's question about why should we be on guard? Why should we be alert? Let's, let's say we're thinking about this in eschatological terms. So we're thinking about end things. If the end is going to happen, why be alert to anything, right? Like, it's going to happen. So, so what are we supposed to be watching out for? Why does that matter? Yeah, what are the signs that we should be looking for, right? Like, you're naming all these things that are, just happen all the time. That doesn't give us anything to actually be watching for. And even if we, have, we can figure out what the signs are, what difference does it make? It will not make it faster. It will not make it slower. Yeah. It will just happen, and there you go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that must mean that keeping watch must not have to do with the end coming. It has to do with something leading to the end and however it affects us, right? Because if the end is going to happen, yeah. no matter what, it's beyond our control, then what's the point of doing any watching if, if watching has to pertain to what is happening at the end? Mm -hmm. So it must be something leading up to the end. Keeping your faith. Okay. So what do we mean by that? Because you, so, Sally mentions that, and um, yeah, Lori mentioned that earlier. Keep, you know, keep in the Bible. Uh-huh. Faithful. Keeping faithful. faithful. Okay. Yeah, faithful. yeah. It's like I said, it's easy. You know, some people will go, hey, well, the world's going to end, right? So why shouldn't I go out and get drunk and have throw a party and because it's going to happen? Well, those of us that are Christian aren't going to do it because we are all trying to live the life that Jesus invoked in us. Mm -hmm. And so you've got two ends of the spectrum. As a Christian, the keeping of the watch like, is staying true to God and to Jesus. On the other hand, at the end, you do have people that go, if it's going to happen, watch what I can do. If I'm going to hell, bam, I'm burning down. But they so, don't know either. That's what I'm saying. You've got two, you've got your Christians. In well, but what I'm saying is, if I wanted to do that, and it's very appealing, 
If I want to do a throw party. <laughs> <laughs> when, when's the party? When can I party? Do I party now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, give me That's right. Yeah. His dad hasn't told him yet. Yeah. Well, but he is his dad. Fathers <laughs> <laughs> don't tell you everything. He's <laughs> <laughs> his own grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if the father knows, he has to know. I mean, that is really it. No, really. That is one of those statements that I'm kind of going, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've man. I've never been very excited about that statement because it doesn't make any sense. He missed the memo. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I want to run with this faithfulness idea, Sorry. but I think, but I think it's actually going to help answer the question once we get a bit more specific about what we mean by faithfulness, right? Because as we've been learning throughout this um, study, the context of the passage often helps us answer these sorts of questions, right? So if we're talking about faithfulness as our means of keeping watch. What specific ways is Jesus saying we should be faithful in? Given the whole context of what we've been reading in today's passage and maybe even last week's passage and previously. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where the false prophets come in. <laughs> Watch out for him. Yeah. Talk more about what that means. Like staying faithful to him. Stands out as the the most important. Right, right, right. My question is what does faithfulness look like? And why did he say that if that's what he meant? <laughs> 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 Jesus always told parables. Nothing ever changed. Well, it sure makes it hard for us who speak English in the 21st century, though. And there's the bigger part. They didn't speak English, so all of this is translated over and over and over again, so there's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's a cop out. But... <laughs> we're getting there. No, we're making the right progress. Help me figure out what are the specific ways Jesus calls us to be faithful. Don't sell your soul out. In here, in Mark. Within the context of what we're reading. He's saying don't panic. Okay. He's saying don't panic. Panic because of what? What would cause a panic? Worry. All the destruction. Being afraid. Being afraid. Of what? What if we lived in Palestine right now? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Okay, but think again. We're trying to get back to the context. Context of this. Rumors of book. war. Okay. War. Yeah. But lots of people are are saying that this could be the beginning of World War Three. Uh huh. Still haven't hit it, have we? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. Okay. Don't. I. I we're going to find the answer for us in our context, but start in the ancient context of, and the literary context of the book. Okay, what is happening in the context of the book? We're, we're getting there. We're getting closer. We, there are things to be afraid of. There are wars and rumors of wars. Get more specific, though. What is the major conflict that has been bubbling throughout Mark? <laughs> the, the, the Roman, the, they were trying to prove that uh, Caesar was king and whatnot, and so 
instead of Jesus being Lord and Master of everything. Yes, okay, we're, we're getting closer. Yay. Yay, okay. So you have Romans saying Caesar is king, Caesar is Lord, Caesar's in charge. What are Jewish people saying? Well, some of them are, but many of them are not. Right. And in, in the passage we are reading tonight, he's warning about all sorts of false messiahs, false prophets that are being lorded out amongst the Jewish people. So keep watch for the ways they are potentially going to deceive you from leaving me and my way and joining their revolution, right? It, it, it can't be lost on us, the political aspects of Mark's gospel. Um, and I know that, that when we start talking politics and Bible and theology, that gets kind of messy quickly. But just thinking about ancient first century Palestine, Israel, political context. When Jesus says he is the Messiah, that is political in the sense that he's asking people to follow him as opposed to being a part of any sort of other revolution that could come up in the Jewish world against the Romans. That's one side. And on the other side, being a part of the Roman occupation and rule that is oppressing and taking advantage of the Jewish people. Jesus said, don't get involved in any of that. Stay faithful to me. That's what you need to watch out for. And it's, and it's not just in those macro political environments. It's any sort of environment in which people try to sway you into a side that says, this is how we're going to get things figured out. This is how we're going to get things done right. This is how things are going to be saved if we go this way, as opposed to Jesus right. and his way. And they were saying that you can only go to heaven if you earn it, or you can only, uh, if you pay for it. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah. So then we can start thinking about, okay, how does this play out in our lives in the 21st century, right? Um, and it happens in all sorts of different ways. What are ways in which, in our world today, um, there is some sort of claim toward salvation or um, a better life? Maybe that's... Um, when, when you think salvation, think the good life. That's really what God means by that. The good life as in life with God, that is the good life, okay? So use those terms kind of synonymously. What are ways in our current culture that people say, this is the way to the good life that are not the Jesus way? Money. Money, what else? Power, influence. Yes, and any sort of power influence, right? Political power business power, um, yeah, you name it. What else? How about technology? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. The promise of technology that's going to make our lives so much better. <laughs> and, and yet all, all I do is update my computer 30 times a day. Like, it just seems like, yeah, okay. What else? There are others. The latest truck. Yep, yep. So any, anything that we utilize to fill what we think is our deepest needs and desires, so oh, drugs, our alcohol, toys. our toys, yes, our desires for comfort and for, um, we always want to be entertained. Yeah, we think, oh man, if I can, if I can just retire, things would be so much better. <laughs> right? <laughs> But seriously, in our culture, isn't retirement kind of propped up as, ha oh, we made it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, how about being popular or being, sure, yeah. being famous? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Celebrity culture. 
Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay. All of these ways are ways that have been in existence for a long, long time, but are particularly potent in 21st century Western world in America. Ways in which we can be deceived from following in the way of Jesus. Now, many of these things are not bad in and of themselves. The problem becomes when we over-prioritize things, when we think things like politics, when we think things like retirement, when we think things like money, the list goes on and on, are going to save us and make everything better. No. They are tools that can be used as part of our life, but what makes life good is Jesus. That's what we have to be watching out for. Does that make sense? I got to preaching there for a minute, so sorry about that. But yeah, so and and that's when you see the term "watch out," be on alert for it. It comes up multiple times in the Bible, Old Testament as well as New Testament. It's it's all generally referring to this idea of faithfulness. But take the time to think about, okay, what are the specific ways in which the biblical writer is calling the original readers of this text to be faithful? And in light of that, how then should I be faithful? And what are you being faithful to? Yes. Who are you being faithful to? Yes. What's another guy? <laughs> yes. I said that intentionally. Yes. Okay, very good. So <laughs> now that we've covered that, uh, we've, it seems like many of us see ways in which chapter 13 are referring both to the destruction of the temple and what is to come. And I think that is a proper reading. Um, and then I know it's tricky because it gets confusing. Are there certain verses that are specific to the temple? I personally think yes. Are there specific verses that are referring to um, the end times? I also think yes. But I do think that many of them can be referring to both at the same time. So let's take, I'll give you an example of this, um, and then we're going to move on, because I don't want to spend the whole time on chapter 13. I want to get to 14 as well. But you didn't tell us how it's possible for the two who are one I was just hoping I was just hoping you were gonna forget about that part. <laughs> Can that be because Jesus was here on earth at that time when he says not even the sun? But now he's up there now he knows. Maybe some some scholars have thought that. Um, the problem is with that theory is that it calls into question Jesus's full divinity on earth. And uh, historically, we have not wanted to call that into question. Uh, so it's, it's a tricky one. I, ultimately, I don't know that I can answer it, Mike, sorry. Uh, it, it is a, a tricky part of the Trinity which the Trinity is tricky in and of itself. And how, how, does, how are you three persons and one being at the same time? That doesn't make much sense. Um, so I don't know that I have a good answer or even a good response to that. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> the the is... Because I've had so many teachers who had... The answer. Oh, sure. Yeah. The answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, ho I, I hope that my response to last week's question had that same sort of humility coming from me because I, even though I attempted to respond to it, honestly, you, you asked it and I kept thinking about it all week long last week. I, like, I don't know. I don't know what I, maybe I just said words out of nowhere. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I could speculate, but I'll, I'll save you from that this time. <laughs> well, but once again, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're not a loose sleepover. Yeah. No. I will lose sleepover all week. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. So let me ask the question. Okay. I, I, no, it's going to be an easier one, maybe. Is this a passage, and again, I'm going to revert back to translations. Could it, being translated all these years, been translated to not make as much sense to us as it did before it was all translated? Yeah, so... Does uh, that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, Could it have been lost in the translation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to go back to, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago with a similar question. The, the English translations that we have now, they're trying to go from the earliest manuscripts that we can find generally. Um, so it's not like they're going Greek, Latin, uh, German, then English. They're going English directly from Greek, um, from the earliest manuscripts that we have. now. As we've noted also, the NIV and other, um, other translations will mark certain points where certain manuscripts have certain words or even verses, but then we look back further and they don't have those particular words or verses. Um, so NIV has tried to mark that in, in multiple ways. Um, and that actually comes up, it comes up in chapter 14 again. There's a, there's a little uh, note like that. Um, and back in chapter 12 and verse 23. Anyway, so uh, to answer your question, yes, any, well, anytime you have a translation from one language to another language, um, there's never a straight 100% across translation, right? There's always context within a particular language that just can't be translated directly from one language to another. So likely the answer to your question is yes. Early readers probably would have picked up on the idioms and the metaphors and the symbols that are happening within chapter 13 a lot quicker than we do because it would have been more familiar to their vocabulary, the way they, they talk, um, to um, yeah, the, the greater context of their thought um, and of their experience in life and in the world. Um, yeah, it's a good question. That being said, that doesn't mean there's no hope for us in understanding. It just means we have to do the work that we're doing here in this class to try to, as best we can, um, discover what words and phrases mean within their ancient context so that we can interpret it for our own day. And we're never going to get it 100%, but we can work at getting closer and closer so that we have a better understanding of what Mark was trying to convey originally and then we can then utilize that understanding to figure out how we're supposed to live in light of that now. That's a good question. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to give you one, one little quick example of um, a part of chapter 13 that um, can be read both as referring to the temple and as referring to the eschaton. So verse 14 uh, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, quote unquote, standing where it, note, uh, if you have NIV and maybe some of your other translations, we'll have a little note next to it. Uh, what does the note say? No, no, no. no. Uh, there's a little note next to the word it. Yeah, so that's a that's a an interpretive mark. I'm just meaning there's <laughs> just the, the specific word it. <laughs> uh, I'll answer it for you. Uh, it it was it, that word actually is very difficult to translate because it could be it or it could be he. 
Um, so it could be translated as standing where it does not belong. It could also be translated as standing where he does not belong. Let the reader understand. Okay, so with that in mind, that leaves possibilities for what or who the abomination that causes desolation is. So scholars have all sorts of different ideas. Like in my commentary, I think there were eight different ideas for what that could be. I'll mention four, okay? So it could be that it's referring to Emperor Caligula. Caligula, he uh, attempted to erect a statue of himself that he was going to put in the temple. That would have been, mm -mm, no, no, that's an abomination in the Jewish mindset. You can't put statues of an uh, emperor in the temple. This is God's temple, not Caligula's temple. And yucky, gross, okay? So that's one possibility. You remember I mentioned the, the Jewish-Roman war between AD 66 and 70. Some of the zealots actually made the temple a sort of home base for their operations, um, which would have been certainly an abomination, an atrocity in Jewish culture. Um, so they, there's some folks who think that a couple leaders in particular, John and Eleazar, that they are the ones being referred to as the abomination who caused desolation. Um, third option, uh, when the Romans sack Jerusalem, the Roman general, Titus, he makes his way into the sanctuary, into the temple where he should not be. Um, so there's some scholars who think that is the abomination that causes desolation. Or, it could be looking way forward out into the future into whenever uh, the end times are, and it could be an antichrist figure. The uh, Revelation uses the term the beast to refer to uh, some figure um, who causes desolation. Uh, so right there, there, that's just four possible ways of many to interpret what could be happening here. But note that of those four that I mentioned, three of them are specifically within the time period prior to the temple's destruction. So it seems as though those three could be referring specifically to the destruction of the temple theory. But the fourth one could certainly be referring to end times. And it could be that you take the fourth one and one of the other three, or any of the other theories that are out there, and hold them together and say, the abomination that causes desolation is both, for example, Titus, this Roman general who should not be in the temple, but yet comes in and then destroys it. By the way, that would make sense in terms of desolation. Uh, and it's also looking forward to an antichrist figure who also goes somewhere where that Antichrist figure does not belong. Is it the temple? Mm, hard to say, uh, but it could be potentially after a rebuilding of the temple or something like that. Yeah. Does that make sense? How, how one phrase can be interpreted and held together under both interpretations? Yeah. Okay. Enough on 13. Chapter 14. Here's what I want to do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yay, perfect. Everyone needs to get into pairs, and I'm going to assign some reading to you. Yay. This is your favorite part. Okay. So we're going to split chapter 14 into six sections. Um, and so I will assign a section to every pair. You'll read through the section, and like we've done in the past, there will be two questions for you to answer. One, write a one-sentence summary of your section. A one-sentence summary of your section. Number two, sorry, I have to get my note. Decide together what the main point of the section is. 
So one, one sentence, that's a summary of your section. Question number two, one sentence that is the main point of your section, okay? So uh, quickly find a partner and then I'll assign, once, once everyone has a partner, I'll assign what passage you're reading. All right, let's get back together. Let's, let's go through chapter 14, group by group. Uh, hear your summary, main point, and I may even bring up uh, another little interesting factoid or tidbit from the section as well, and we'll see, we'll see how that affects our reading, okay? So, uh, Sally and Betty, I had you first, right? One through 11. Uh, summarize this passage for us. not just words. This is the beginning of what's going to happen. So you have them scheming, plotting. They've got more of a timeline now. We need to do it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. You've got the anointing, or he's at a leper's house, so he's with the outcasts. His anointed, she's pouring the perfume over his body, preparing him for burial. Yeah. And then this is also the first time that it's mentioned of Judas's actions yeah. of going to the chief priests. Yeah. Them. Yeah. So there's a, a few really key things happening here, and, and Betty, you outlined them really well. That there's, you've got the religious leaders in the background who are like, all right, it's time to get something done with Jesus. Meanwhile, he's in Bethany, and this home, we're not really sure where, don't really know who Simon the leper is, but this woman comes in, not even named, and she pours expensive perfume on him as the passage says, uh, to prepare him for burial. So in the ancient world, it was common uh, once someone died that as part of the burial preparations that perfume would be poured on them. Um, so it was a sign of honor for, for that person. Um, that being said, he's not dead yet. Uh, so it makes it kind of odd that she has done this. Uh, but another way that anointing happened was in preparation for a king to take his throne. So you have, in the same action, overtures of his death, a foreshadowing certainly of his death, and overtures of his ascension as king. So Mark is trying to say he's going to take up his throne, as it were, in his death on the cross. Which I think even still to us this day, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But for Mark, it is the main point of his gospel, that um, kingdom, kingdom of godship, I guess, uh, is exemplified in sacrifice. And in this case, that means death, death of Jesus. Yeah. In this uh, translation, it doesn't say in preparation for burial. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It Are you reading said, Passion Translation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she broke the flask and poured out the precious oil mm -hmm. over his head, period. Yeah. Huh. It doesn't go beyond that. Why you say one is like his one? Yeah. And yours is like his? Yeah. yeah. Interesting that they... Yeah. 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 But for. I apologize. It does say that. Also. Okay. Yeah. That's that's the verse that's being referred to. Yeah. In eight. Yeah. Yep. In eight. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Very good. And then. That wasn't assigned to us. Yeah. Right. Right. It's not your fault. Yeah. Yep. 
Yep, and then good observation about Judas. Judas has been a really minor character to this point in Mark's gospel. You read uh, other gospels, that's not so much the case. Judas comes up multiple times. We did, we did get right toward the beginning of Mark. He actually threw Judas under the bus pretty quickly by saying he's the one who's going to betray Jesus. Um, but then we haven't heard from him again. Um, so this is our first uh, little descriptor of Judas acting out that betrayal. And unlike other gospels that give him a motive... Or say, like in John's gospel, that the, like, the devil came upon him. Um, Mark doesn't say that. So it's kind of fascinating. Uh, as far as Mark is concerned, Judas is just acting out what is prophesied about what is to come in Jesus' sacrificial death. Okay, next section, Carlene and Ginny. Well, I, the summary, I think, is they're getting together for the Passover, they're for what we call the Last Supper. This is going to be Jesus and disciples' Last Supper. Yep. And this is where Jesus is going to um, tell them that Judas is going to, that one of them, he says, who, who dips in the bowl with me will betray me. And then he gives them communion. You know, take my, my body and this is my blood. So I think that's the kind of summary of how that happens. I think the main thing, I, I, I see a few different things, and you know, I don't know which ones they mean. But first of all, how he told them in, um, you know, very descriptively to go into the city and follow this man and, and, and find a place and ask where we're going to prepare it. I thought that was, you know. Does that sound like another episode that we've had already? Yeah. What, what episode was that? Bingo. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I thought that was, you know, but, but then, and so, the, and they followed him. They did what, exactly what he said. Yeah. But then it moves right into Judas, somebody's going to betray me, and then he gives communion. So I'm not 100% sure what the main, <laughs> but there is just one main point in that. I just, Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Certainly, there's lots of things. There's lots of things happening there. So uh, I'll, I'll try and go quick here. Uh, I do want to give a little pa um, background to what's happening. Passover, very significant meal, very significant festival in Jewish religious life. It's the remembrance of the passing over of the angel of the Lord uh, as the um, Israelites are just about to be rescued from Egypt. Um, and so all of the Egyptian children, the firstborn, are um, killed, and the Israelite ones are saved by putting the lamb's blood on the door frames so the angel passes over. Right. So Passover is a remembrance of, of and they would even say an acting out of in their present context the themes and symbols of that event and so this meal how many of you have ever been a part of a passover seder before okay some of you have okay um i will say most of the christian ones that you encounter lack some of the jewish depth in it but it gives you at least a little taste of what a Passover meal is like. So you're gathered together with family and extended family, um, and there's actually multiple scenes as part of this meal to help you remember all the different aspects of the story. So they're preparing for the Passover, um, but there's some really noteworthy things happening behind the scenes that we miss. So in, in this particular period of time, while the sacrificial system is still happening, the head of the household should be at the temple helping to slit the throat of the lamb that will then be sacrificed on their behalf. Jesus is not at the temple doing this. So that's fascinating that Jesus is not where most good Jewish men would be on this day. Um, in fact, He's not even in Jerusalem. He tells his disciples, you go into the city. Um, so also kind of fascinating there. They go in and they seem to, it seems to be a sort of secret. Uh, we're going to prepare in the secret place, um, probably under the assumption that 
it's unsafe right now for Jesus to be in Jerusalem, given uh, all his critiques of the temple, uh, and and then even the Romans. Um, so they go in, they get everything prepared for this meal, and then they're in the midst of the Passover meal, and Jesus er, shifts things when he says, this is my body, and this is my blood. So this is the institution This is the very first time that we get what we now call communion or the last or the Lord's Supper um, or the Eucharist. Uh, Eucharist, by the way, is from the Greek word for Thanksgiving, uh, which comes from this passage. Jesus broke the bread, gave thanks. Um, So in case you're ever wondering where that word came from. Okay. So so Jesus is essentially reenacting, recreating the Passover meal in specifically Christian terms, pointing to himself as the Passover lamb because he wasn't there to sacrifice the Passover lamb, right? Like he is the sacrifice. He is the body. He is the blood of a new covenant. Um, And so he's enacting a new covenant feast for the people of God, for his followers in this episode. Does that make sense? Okay. Which probably must have left the disciples quite bewildered. Absolutely it would have. Yeah. They would have, they would have been beside themselves because they've done Passover hundreds of times. Yep, exactly. So they would have known the script by heart. Yeah. And so when he flips the script... What? And then if they second take, like, did he just say, this is my body? Like, that's some weird sort of cannibalistic stuff. But, which, by the way, was a common critique of early Christians. Did you know that? Uh, because they instituted um, communion and believed that somehow in some mysterious way through the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup that Jesus was present in it somehow folks, the pagan folks, were like, these Christians are cannibals. That's weird. <laughs> so that was a common criticism of early Christians. And so, and certainly the Jewish folks would have been very uncomfortable with that sort of language. And so, yeah, yeah. I imagine the disciples would have been very taken aback by that. Okay, so we have the, the institution of the Lord's Supper to be a meal for... Um, Jesus' followers to remember, bringing us to 27 through 42. Pat and Linda. And then he's uh, in the garden praying, and that's the main point that Jesus follows God's will. He he prays, what, three times for it to go away, and uh, Jesus says, no, I will do it. Yep. Very good. A couple of things to notice that are intertextual connections from... uh, passages we've just read. Uh, So we just made a big deal about the watch, keep watch. And so Jesus takes his disciples out to a garden so he can pray. And essentially, it it doesn't say outright, but the, the meaning is clear. Keep watch for me while I pray. And they go right to sleep. Yep. Yep. So it's a way that the passage is conveying the disciples are already neglecting this command that Jesus has just given and made a big deal about. Okay, So they start to fall asleep. We just had the Last Supper, and there was a big deal about the cup, blood of the new covenant, and Jesus is praying this prayer in the garden, will you take this cup from me? Which... Of course, in context, is referring to his death, his sacrifice. And yet, not what I will, but you will. Yeah, 
so um, the, the thing that Jesus is very concerned about, watch out, be alert, be faithful, don't fall asleep in following me, they literally do, as he is in his hour of need. Um, quite telling that, that Jesus says quite openly, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He does not want to die. And yet, in his prayer time, it is made clear that he must continue forward in the direction that he is going. And then at the very end of that episode, he sees his betrayer coming, which leads us to 43 through 52. We even wrote it down. That's right. Our summary says, we don't know who wrote this. With Judas's help, <laughs> Jesus was arrested in secret to protect those who were arresting him. In the chaos, and this, this is, I don't ever remember reading this. In the chaos, there is a man unrelated to the arrest who only avoids capture by running away naked. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, the disciples were quick enough to leave clothes. Yeah. And so we think the main point is that both scripture and the words of Jesus were fulfilled in this event of his arrest. Very good. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So we get to this climactic point. Well, not the total climax, but it is definitely a very important point in the narrative where Judas is actively betraying Jesus Notice how he does it. So in the um, ancient Jewish world, and this is still true in some Eastern cultures, um, it's very common to greet other people with a kiss. It's a sign of respect and affection, um, even amongst men doing this sort of thing. So Judas uses this sign of respect and affection to betray Jesus. The hypocrisy is just so clear there in that. The men sees him. You have um, in Mark. We don't know who got the sword, where the sword came from. Uh, doesn't seem to care to tell us. But someone got a sword, cut off high priest, a servant's ear. And it doesn't yep. get restored. And in Mark, yes, that's correct. Mark doesn't um, add that Jesus puts it back on and heals it. Um, it seems that Mark is more concerned with Jesus' reply. Am I leading a rebellion? That you come out with swords and clubs? In other words, I've been just teaching in the, in the temple and traveling around, healing people. I haven't been stirring up trouble. And yet you're here to arrest me because scriptures must be fulfilled. Yep. So then everyone takes off. <laughs> And as we've talked about before, when you have this really weird stuff, that's stuff to pay attention to. And 51 and 52 have baffled people for 2,000 years. <laughs> Who is this young man? Why is he there? And why is he only, why is he only in a linen garment outside <laughs> at night? And why is it that in the hubbub of everything... He sheds the garment and runs naked. <laughs> Thus the title of our class. <laughs> Running naked in the garden. Yeah. Okay. So what is happening here? So there's a lot of different ideas about what 51 and 52 could be saying. Um, probably saying truth or death. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I double dog dare you. <laughs> Is there a flagpole nearby that he can lick? <laughs> oh, goodness. So, um, often in these sorts of instances where it's like, what is happening? As we've talked about, there's usually some sort of symbolic or metaphorical meaning going on. So, um, I've got six different 
possibilities. And these are not all of them. These are just the ones that I like. Uh, okay, so number one, who is the young man? He symbolizes the shame of the disciples, right? The disciples have, in the last two episodes, fallen asleep at his watch. Um, he's warned, Jesus has warned them they're going to uh, deny him right before that. Um, and then, in this one, they run away. Um, so this young man running away naked is a symbol of their shame. Number two, um, and similar, symbolizes the disciples' failure to follow Jesus all the way to the cross and their abandonment of him. So you could easily combine one and two into the same thing. Uh, number three, uh, that this is actually a little preview of a young man that we will see later in this gospel at a very important point, actually, in chapter 16, verse 5. Hmm, that's interesting. So, could be that. Um, many scholars think that this is actually Mark himself, uh, that he has written himself into the narrative um, as, as he's, yeah, a sort of, yeah, like he... Um, and, and this was kind of common in, in the ancient world that um, if you wanted to write yourself into the narrative uh, that you were not a part of, you could do that in all sorts of interesting ways. It's telling that he didn't make himself look good. He intentionally makes him look the worst, actually, of all the disciples. Like, not just does he run away, he's naked. Very shameful. And remember, we've talked about how in this context, honor and shame, the most important things. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that would be very telling. So some scholars think this is a way Mark has written himself in. Um, it could be, number five, a fulfillment of Amos chapter 2, verse 16. And in two, uh, Amos 2, uh, verse 16, there's this um, phrase that says, even the, the um, does it say the soldiers? Even the soldiers will run away naked. Uh, so a, a prophetic way of talking about how um, when the Messiah comes, um, that even the bravest will run away. Or number six, and this is my personal view, that it's actually a mix of meanings all happening at the same time. Maybe it's Mark, maybe it's not. Either way, his fleeing and nakedness suggest shame. And they echo the Garden of Eden. Okay, think about this for a moment. Garden and Eden, yep, Garden of Eden. Who gets created first, Adam and Eve? Are they clothed? No, they are innocent. But when they mess up, they recognize their shame and they flee from God in their shame. They try to hide. God then comes and covers their shame. But the damage is done, and so they are then expelled from the garden. Really, the whole thrust of the biblical narrative is let's get back to the garden because that's where we're in relationship with God as it's supposed to be. So this event that um, is being inaugurated in Jesus' betrayal, what's going to lead to his sacrificial death, is the way that God removes the shame of humanity, the way that he restores us from our unfaithfulness so that we can return to the garden state. In other words, back into relationship with God. So the, so the man running naked is a foreshadowing of all of these things happening all at once. <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, 53 through 65. Um, okay, basically, so, 
what got out of the summer or what I got out of it was that they took him to the uh, home of the high priest. And they were trying to come up with, you know, what can we use as an excuse to, to kill him? And they had all kinds of people, and nobody could come up with a straight story. And finally, somebody came up and says, well, you know, um, they told their lie. And they asked him, they says, you know, are you the son of God? And I think this is where he finally says, yes, I am. And it's the big revelation. Good. Yeah. So that's your, your summary and your main point all together in one. Yes. That right. Is the okay. Very good. That is correct. This is the end. We've talked about the messianic secret, right? Jesus keeps saying, shh, don't tell anybody about me. This ends that. Uh, he is specifically asked, are you the Messiah? It's telling that he uses the words, I am. We talked about that being used before. What does that refer to? God, good. Burning bush story. I am that I am. I am who I am. Yes. Okay. So he's making a statement about his messiahship and his divinity all in two words. <laughs> yep. I am. Uh, and then he goes on, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, God the Father, and coming on the clouds of heaven. So furthering that portrayal of him as divine and as the Messiah, the King. Yes, correct. Yeah, <laughs> so um, when the high priest hears this, this is blasphemy from his point of view. Uh, so it makes sense that he tears his clothes, which is a sign of great anguish in uh, the Jewish scriptures. Um, <laughs> and so then they're like, doesn't matter what the witnesses say, he just confessed to blasphemy. Um, so they all condemn him. Correct. So, yes, he, f he fully confirms to the public that he is the Messiah. Very good. Last group. You can talk. Um, okay, I'm just going to go ditto with the whole <laughs> man running through the naked because that's what Peter, what happened with Peter here. Peter promised Jesus he would always remain faithful. Yeah. Never deny him. It's never going to happen. Then there Peter stands. And Peter just stood there and tried to stay physical self instead of trying to stay faithful to Jesus. But once he denied Jesus three times, he realized what he did and he wept. Which to me is a sign of remorse. Yep. More than anything else, more than just being sad, it was a sign of remorse for what he did. Yep. Yep. Good. Uh, I haven't done nearly enough words today, so I'm going to give you one from this story. <laughs> Aparnase is the word that gets translated a little bit differently depending on what translation you have, but it's disown or deny. And, and can also be translated as to be ashamed or to be ashamed of. So, yes, Peter oh, no, I'll never aparnase you. I'll never be ashamed of you. Remember, shame and honor are so important in their culture. I'll never do that. And then we have just a couple episodes later. Not only does he do it, he does it three times, as Jesus predicts, all before the rooster crows twice. Well, he also cursed and swore. Yes. And, and there's... That's a really bad thing. Correct, yeah. So um, some of your translations are doing some of the interpretive work um, because there are some translations that will outright say he began to call down curses upon Jesus. Some of ours do not say that. Um, the Greek is actually a little bit more vague, but the assumption that many 
interpreters and translators have is that he is calling down curses on Jesus. So not, as, not only is he ashamed, but he's willing to curse mm -hmm. him because of these interactions. I mean, a, a very quick turn from, I'll never leave you, to mm -hmm. cursing. Mm -hmm. Why would Mark include this story? I think it's because the early church probably had this problem, that they would have people who'd come along and they would say, oh yeah, I love Jesus. He's a cool dude. And then you get into it a little ways and, and either the persecution that was happening or the worries of life. Remember that that's a, um, uh, the story of the seeds. What's that called? Uh, it's a parable. Yeah, thank you. See? I'm tired. Uh, That's Betty. <laughs> you're Roger, right? Um, Billy Bob. Yeah. Uh, in that parable, he's naming all sorts of things that can pull people away from being faithful to Jesus. And the you know, worries... Um, hard times, persecution, all that sort of thing was probably happening in the early church. And so they tell the story of how Peter, I mean, I mean, it's getting kind of hairy, but it hasn't gotten really hairy yet. I mean, they're just asking him, aren't you one of the guys that hangs out with Jesus? You're a Galilean, right? And he's, yeah, right. You're so, he's so quick to abandon so quick and it seems like that was probably common in the early church so it was a way of the church saying this is don't don't abandon like stay faithful keep watch um because in the end you're going to regret it just like peter did yep okay very good all right well you covered a lot tonight thanks for sticking around i know it's late i appreciate you all for uh, your thoughts, your input, going through small group discussion together. Uh, because we were able to get through all of this, we should be able to wrap up next week. So um, that'll be a last one. Oh, class on Mary Magdalene. <laughs> she just she does happen to show up in the, our reading next week, so. I, I would encourage you, read ahead. Read 15 and 16. Um, in fact, if you really want to earn extra credit, <laughs> no, read 15 and 16 every day for the next week. So just keep reading it over and over and soak it in. Um, I predict that that will actually become a very challenging thing for you to do. Because I think as you will read, you will start to enter into the story and you will see how traumatizing and painful it truly is. But I think that is really actually long-term beneficial for us to understand how significant um, Jesus' suffering and death is for us. So anyway, that's my challenge for you. At least read it once. If you want extra credit, read it once a day for the next seven days. Hey, you can memorize it. Thanks, everybody.